Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel for the Renaissance English History Podcast. Today we remember the death of Catherine Parr, which happened today, September 5th, and take a minute to discuss what might have happened to her daughter, little Mary Seymour. If you are new here, a very special warm welcome to you. I'm your host, Heather. I've been podcasting on Tudor England since 2009. This is the place where I put all of my episodes from all of my various podcasts, as well as loads of extra content like this video right here. Very quick reminder, TudorCon is this weekend, like four days away, three days away. I've lost track of what, t- what day it is, but it starts Friday, September 8th. And you can still grab your streaming ticket at englandcast.com slash TudorCon online, englandcast.com slash TudorCon online to join in three days of an immersive, tutorific weekend. So for those who are familiar with Henry VIII's Six Queens, Catherine Parr's story will be familiar to you, but let's just walk briefly through it once more. Catherine Parr came from the English nobility. Her journey saw her widowed twice before she was paired with the most powerful man in England. She was Henry's final consort. She was far more than a mere queen in name. She was the rare woman who stood as regent while Henry campaigned in France, a testament to the trust that the king placed in her. She was also a fervent Protestant. She wasn't just influential in the court's politics, but also in England's religious history. She championed education, and she was the first English queen to publish under her own name. Yet amidst the vast narratives of the court, wars, and faith, A personal chapter of Catherine's life often remains overshadowed, the tale of her daughter, Mary Seymour. So following Henry VIII's death, Catherine quickly rekindled a former romance with Thomas Seymour, the ambitious brother of the late Queen Jane Seymour, also the brother of the protector, Edward Seymour. Their swift marriage just months after the king's death was a topic of hushed whispers in the corridors of power. And in fact, While Princess Elizabeth was more okay with it, Princess Mary, future Queen Mary, was 100% not okay with it. She was a big no to Catherine and Thomas getting married, and there's letters where she talks about how upset she is about it. So Thomas was a man who was constantly in the shadow of greater ambitions. His title as the Lord Admiral of England and his proximity as the uncle to the young King Edward VI meant that he was always close to the epicenter of power. His marriage to Catherine further cemented his influential position, but it also invited scrutiny. I'm not going to talk about all of the stuff between him and Elizabeth, Princess Elizabeth, when she was staying there. We're just going to stay on Catherine's story right now. So in 1548, Catherine announced her pregnancy. For the Dowager Queen, this represented a long-awaited joy. She was on her fourth marriage now, the one where she was actually in love for the first time, and she could finally be a mother, something she hadn't experienced in her previous marriages. Tragedy, however, was on the horizon. Not long after giving birth to her daughter, Mary, Catherine succumbed to purple fever, childbed fever, um, postnatal complications at Sudley Castle. The dream of a peaceful family with her newborn daughter and husband was cruelly snatched away. With Catherine's passing, Thomas's ambitions would further spiral, leading him down a very perilous path. And, of course, young Mary was caught in the storm. Just days after Mary's birth, when Catherine Parr passed away, Thomas decided to leave Mary under the care of his own brother, Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset, also the protector. But then things got very, very messy when Thomas was executed for treason when Mary was just a few months old. So then Mary was entrusted to the care of Catherine Willoughby, Duchess of Suffolk, a dear friend of Catherine's. We would think that the Seymours, her family, might want to take her in, but it doesn't seem that way. Mary was relocated to the Duchess of Suffolk's main home in Grimsthorpe in Lincolnshire, Even though she was just a young child at this point, her upkeep seems to have been a point of contention. The Duchess wrote letters about her expenses and sought help from Cecil, who was then associated with Somerset, to help pay the bills. Fortunately, by autumn 1549, when she would have been about a year old, some funds were approved for Mary. 
And by January of 1550, there was actually a legal move to ensure that Mary got her inheritance from Thomas Seymour's properties. However, the reality was somber. There wasn't much left for Mary. And by September of 1550, the financial assistance had stopped. And there's an understanding that Mary might have passed away then around her second birthday. So there's an intriguing story suggesting that Mary might have lived and had been cared for by the Aglian bees who had ties with the Pars and then later married a man close to Anne of Denmark, the queen of James VI of Scotland, the first of England. But there's no solid evidence of this. There's no solid proof. And it was all too common, of course, for children at that age to die young. So I'm leaning towards the heartbreaking possibility that Mary left this world as a toddler. There's also a wonderful historical kind of time slip novel by Nicola Cornick that explores the idea that Mary might have lived. It's called The Phantom Tree, if you want to check it out. And I would love to believe that. But sadly, I just don't. It seems like Mary probably died when she was only about two years old. So it's a very sad ending. When you think about where Catherine Parr was in January of 1547 or February of 1547, when she was a widow from Henry VIII, the Dowager Queen, she could finally marry for love. She marries Thomas. Then there's, you know, whatever episodes happen with Princess Elizabeth, she sends Princess Elizabeth away. She's now with her love and she's going to give birth. She has this daughter and, you know, for a day, it must have been very, very happy. And then she died and then Thomas fell apart and then Mary died. So it all kind of just ended for this this little trio. So it's it's sad, but I think it's also important to remember these stories that were all too common of these children dying very young. And yes, it's heartbreaking. But I think it's important to remember that there was that part of Catherine Parr. She was a mother, and we don't often remember that part about her, and we don't often think about what happened to little Mary Seymour. But little Mary Seymour deserves to be remembered and deserves to be known. And so that's why I'm talking about her today. All right. Thank you so much for watching. If you have made it to the end of this video and enjoyed it, I hope I earned your subscription to my channel where I put out videos like this almost every day and also a press of that like button, which helps to tutorify your YouTube algorithm. You are deeply loved and appreciated. I appreciate you watching. Don't forget to drink your water and I will see you in the next video. Thanks so much for watching.